Hi, Dr. Boz here again. And today we're gonna to talk about something that I see in patients that I think should be a public service announcement. And this is the consequences of a gastric bypass. If you've watched several of these videos, you know by now that I'm an internal medicine physician and I look at the patient's long game. Their health consequences over the long haul are what I'm in the business of helping them with. I would contend that one of the greatest crimes to help someone lose weight has been what we do with a gastric bypass. I think medicine focused on a surgery and a cutting intervention at an astronomically high price that didn't have the root in fixing how patients change their thinking and their chemistry for weight loss. Gastric bypass might be the greatest crime against humanity done by medicine ever, if you ask me. Let's go through why. Let's take the profile of the patients who end up with a gastric bypass. They've been overweight for years and they have to be a certain amount of weight overweight, like 100 to 150 pounds overweight. That's an incredible high inflammatory, high insulin state, no matter which way you look at it. So they enter into a contract with the surgeons and with the medical team to say, yep, we're gonna cut out a section of your intestines, we're gonna slice off part of your abdomen, and then we're going to put you into a follow-up program that is gonna last a year. I would contend that if you interview patients before and after the gastric bypass surgery, their brains aren't working right. Their chemistry has made their brains foggy, their mental cognition is slower, and they're by definition malnourished at the beginning. When patients are incredibly overweight, it doesn't mean that they have an abundance of the right types of nourishment inside their body. In fact, I would say people get stuck with an overweight uh, profile many times because of the lack of certain nourishments that would improve the way their brain works, improve their energy, and turn back on their metabolism. So the patients go in for this very dangerous surgery in that you have the risk of blood loss. It's not that you're taking off a, a mole in the superficial skin. You're deep in the cavity of the abdomen with major blood vessels, um, major risks. Uh, the surgeon does their part by cutting off the edges of uh, the stomach and removing part of the intestine. And what they've just assigned the patient to is a lifelong malabsorption syndrome. Most of the time, the patient will follow up, do everything in their heart that they can to follow the rules that the surgeon sets forth. They are following up with these visits weekly, sometimes twice a month, and then once a month. By the end of the year, they're supposed to be masters in how this malnourishment profile will impact them for the rest of their life. When I usually encounter them, it's five to 10 years later, and they don't remember hardly any of the rules that were set forth by that surgical team. Maybe it's because their brains just couldn't absorb the information. Maybe it's time. Maybe it's selectively they don't want to remember. But for whatever reason, they usually have very low iron levels, very low zinc levels. Magnesium is low, but that's low on everybody. Um, and in part, the reason these copper, zinc, iron levels are so low is because the section of their intestines that's supposed to absorb it is missing. Many times a high fat meal will cause intense diarrhea. Uh, that is a signal that they're not absorbing fat. Uh, that sounds like a good thing when you're counting calories, but it's not a good thing when you're looking at the essential nutrients that's needed to repair brains, to improve an immune system, to improve uh, the function of nerves and the way your body functions. Uh, it has not been an uncommon finding to find the patient in heart failure due to severe malnourishment 10 years after a gastric bypass, all unbeknownst to the patient. In fact, it's so complicated, I often have to have a patient's chaperone or loved one come with them to the appointments to explain all the things that we need to replace 10 years after a gastric bypass. I would contend the right thing to do with somebody 100 to 150 pounds overweight is to teach them about a ketogenic diet. Whenever I have a patient who is severely obese, God forbid if they've had a gastric bypass, the two foods that I introduce them to that they have to put on their plate enough to really give it an all-American try is sardines and liver. Yeah, 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 you can make a wrinkled face. I get it, it sounds terrible. 
But if there are two foods that are so packed with the nutrients that your body needs, especially if you're overweight, sardines and liver win every time. Take a look at this chart and focus in on uh, the two lines with sardines and liver. As you look across all those red circles and the ones that are written in red, they, those are the ones of all of these highly nourishing foods. They win for the levels of vitamin A, B1, B1, B2, B3, B6, uh, B12, folate. And again, sardines and liver don't sound like something where you would be getting all of these nutrient-dense vitamins. But when I ask patients who've been on a ketogenic diet how uh, their palates have changed over the six months, they thank me for saying, I'm so glad you introduced me to that. It has become a way that not only they returned that food to their diet, but the next generation is getting a taste of it much earlier than my patients did. The one thing I like to teach about when it comes to why liver is so important to replace has to do with the absorption of iron. Again, this is in that section of the gut that if you have fat malabsorption, it doesn't work very well. But if you've had a gastric bypass, it's in the surgeon's garbage bag. They took it out of you. That section of gut is, is responsible for absorbing iron, copper, and zinc. But let's focus on iron. So iron comes in two forms in our world. You can have it in an elemental form, which means it comes from the soil. If you look at the iron in spinach, that would be an elemental form of iron. It's the roots will pull it out of the dirt and put it into the leaf of the iron. When we took radio tags uh, and tagged the iron in elemental iron, and we put it into healthy subjects to see how much of the iron was absorbed, we could see that in the healthiest patients, the perfect patients, the highest level of absorption for elemental iron was 10%. So nine particles are going out into the toilet and only one out of 10 are being absorbed into your system. You hardly need a better teaching example than if you've ever been pregnant and the doctor said you should be on a multivitamin with iron. And if you can take two, that's great. Uh, multivitamin with iron is very important for the baby's growth, the baby's brain development, and it's not uncommon for women to get anemic, which is in part due to that low iron. So the women will take iron pills and by about the second week, they are constipated. Why? Because those nine out of 10 particles of elemental iron are flushing out their colon and out through the toilet. Only one out of 10 is being absorbed. Let's compare that to the other type of iron, which is hemoglobin surrounded iron. This means that it has been in a circulation. It has hemoglobin proteins around the iron. I don't care if that iron came from a fish or a duck or a moose or a goat. I don't care which kind of circulation it's been in. But that iron that's been in circulation, when we tag that and study how much of it is absorbed in a healthy person, nine elements of the iron got absorbed while only one ended up in the toilet. So it's the re almost exact opposite of what happened with elemental iron. So how do you find high concentrations of hemoglobin surrounded iron? You guessed it, liver. Liver is the highest density of iron. And in several cultures uh, here in the United States, but if you look back through civilization, there was a ritual that all of the children had to have a dose of the liver from the animal. And what they were doing was ensuring that those children had the nourishment needed for them to grow. I think that tradition might be a little tough even for my stomach, but I have introduced Braunschweiger or liverwurst into my family's tradition. We use a great recipe, which is two parts Braunschweiger and one part cream cheese, mix it together, and then roll it in bacon bits, and my kids love it. Uh, again, they didn't love it the first time we had it, but it's something that through education and through coaxing them to say this is really important for your development, I have figured out how to get them to eat it too. Let me close by saying, if you've had a gastric bypass, please, please make sure you follow up with a good internist or a family practice doctor. I can't say that enough for how many patients have come to me wilted and malnourished, only to be leaving my clinic six months later a restored person by addressing these malnourishment problems. Thanks again. I'm signing off as Dr. Boz.